Uh, well, obviously, thank you for having me today. Uh, now, there are obviously people in the room, so if I'm looking at off camera, you'll notice that I'm probably talking to people that uh, you can't see. Uh, and there's obviously a fantastic audience out there today that will be uh, looking to add some value to, I hope. Um, what we'll do is we're looking around about 45 minutes to take you through uh, the piece of work that we're going to talk about, which is effectively getting a faster yes. Uh, and then we're going to allow some time at the end because there's always some great questions that come from the audience around uh, their particular needs and their businesses, uh, but also some, um, some pretty common themes that we all, uh, and challenges that we all face. So today, uh, the straight through processing, um, learning how to uh, high performance brokers uh, get a faster yes. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, there are 2.1 million small businesses out there in Australia. Um, we are a nation of small business uh, operators. Um, it is a really tough environment. Uh, I just spent the last couple of weeks away uh, doing a lot of reading and listening and obviously looking at a lot of industry commentary about what's actually happening in our industry. Uh, so as small business owners, uh, not just brokers, uh, Part of what we're going to talk about today, obviously, is process. But the importance of process, where it sits in your overall business, um, you are having to fight off a variety of different things happening at the moment. So everything from ASIC and APRA to interesting articles from Choice during the week uh, to you know, commission reviews, etc., uh, all while trying to delight your existing clients uh, and get a faster yes. So what we're really talking about. Um, the biggest common complaint that I get from the brokers um, that I look after and, and the business that I run is time. Um, they never have enough of it. Um, and my question always is, what are you actually doing with it? Uh, we have a lot of inefficiencies uh, in our industry. Um, I've spent the last 25 years in banking and finance. Um, we'll talk a little bit about my background in a second. Uh, but the biggest complaint I get every day is time. Things take too long. Um, you know, we're a distribution point for a manufacturer. That's effectively what we are. Um, brokers effectively write loans for banks, uh, but the bank's slow. So you'll hear a common number at the moment, 10. Uh, 10 being the number of days it takes to pick up a deal at a number of institutions at the moment. Uh, a lot of things can get done in 10 days. I think sometimes you could probably build a house in 10 days. Uh, so we are constrained by certain things, but time generally is the biggest thing that, uh, that we talk about. Uh, during uh, a course that I run, which we'll talk a little bit about today as well, Broker Essentials, we talk about the golden hour. Um, again, that one hour uh, that you spend in front of a client, it might be two, it might be three, but that golden hour or golden hours that you spend in front of a client, when you've got a 60-day purchase settlement, there are 1,440 hours that you actually spend with that client. But you generally only spend one or two or maybe three hours in front of that client. If you were to actually talk to your client after those hours or hour when you're doing your sales interviews and, and working on solutions for them, you'll generally find that those clients are absolutely delighted. Um, if you did a net promoter score, you'll find that you'll get a 9.5 or a 10 most of the time because your client's always pretty impressed with what you're up to. Generally what we find, however, after that first hour is that in our industry, because of the way that we work, because of processing, because of constraints and how we actually get our, our business conducted, uh, it's effectively a, uh, it's a downward slope from there. There's a lot of opportunities to effectively upset a client after that first hour and that's what we need to be really conscious of. So use of our time, use of efficiencies, uh, use of um, you know, your resources, this is one of the most critical things. All right, welcome, come in. Thank you. <laughs> um, come in, guys, come on that side. So, um, with time, uh, what we're talking about here today effectively is to get a faster yes, it's about processes. Everything is a process. Everything that we do, whether that be the sales process, the application process, for those of you that run larger brokerages or have people that work for you or work for people, the hiring process, so that might be everything from HR to marketing, to resourcing, uh, everything is a process. So today we're going to talk very heavily about uh, processes. Right? So when we're talking about how to get a faster yes, one of the biggest constraints in our industry for a lot of businesses is they actually don't have great processes in place. 54% of our industry are actually single operators. Right? Um, in the room today we've actually got a few people who are new to industry, so they've been in the industry for less than six months. Uh, and when we talk about what we do here as a business, um, I'm very heavily around talking about processes. You'll find that our industry heavily talks about being relationship orientated, uh, which is fantastic. You do need to be able to create and develop great relationships with your clients. But no matter how great your relationship actually is, if you can't actually deliver to your client because you don't have great processes, you're just a great broker who couldn't deliver. In fact, now you're not a great broker anymore. You're just an average broker. 
So processes actually hold up the foundation for our ability to deliver to our clients. So we're going to talk a lot, a lot about processes today, uh, ad nauseum uh, if, if anything else, um, because I really want to drill into once your processes are right, the foundations to your businesses are right, you can then focus on forward facing activities that add real value. In that golden hour when we're talking about time, the real value that your client buys from you is the advice that you give. It is the comfort that you give them, that is the journey that you take them on. It's not your ability to push paperwork around a desk, right? To process something through AOL, to use Mercury in a great way. Your client cares effectively what the time is. They don't care about how the watch works, okay? So again, we'll talk about that a lot today. A little bit of background to what's happening in the industry at the moment. As you would all know, um, it's a really interesting time. There are some 15,400 brokers in the Australian market. Of that 15,400, we know that around about 60% sit within New South Wales and Victoria. So there's a significant amount of brokers in a very competitive industry. For those of you who've done basic economics, you'll, hear, you'll have heard of uh, Porter's Five Forces. Um, we have very low barriers to entry to enter into our market. So one of the things that we've got to be mindful of is that we've got a lot of people coming into the marketplace. So if you're looking at this particular quadrant here, um, you're seeing that effectively brokers are outstripping the level of debt. So brokers are rising faster than the debt levels are rising and with all the changes that are happening in the market at the moment, debt levels will obviously start to slow or stagnant in certain parts. You'll see down here effectively that there's more coming than going. So there are more brokers entering the market than there are actually retiring or leaving or selling their books. So again, it's a really interesting time for our particular market. And as I said, for these two particular states in particular, New South Wales and Victoria, there's a really heavy presence of brokers. Consumers in these particular states um, obviously like what we do. Uh, another market that's very uh, strong uh, relative to its um, population size is WA. Uh, WA has had a very good uh, and steep history in the brokering market. So again, interesting times. So for anyone new to the industry, you'd think, God, why would I be coming in at this particular time? The beauty is, is if you take the basic mathematics that sit behind um, uh, the number of mortgage holders actually in the marketplace, if you divide that by number of brokers, very simple equation, it basically equates to around about 1,500 clients per broker. Now, if you've got 1,500 clients or you're working into getting 1,500 clients, it's a pretty good life. Okay, in the sense of you're working damn hard to actually acquire clients, you'd have a very good customer retention program uh, and you'd actually be earning some reasonable remuneration, but you wouldn't be doing it on your own either. At 1,500 clients, uh, you'd probably have a support structure that sits behind you as well. So when you're looking at those sort of numbers, the top brokers in the country, so Mark Davis from my office, uh, many of you will know Mark's uh, uh, name and you'll certainly know his numbers and what he writes. When you're writing $300 million plus a year, uh, Mark has somewhere in the order of around about 3,500 clients. Um, when you're looking at those sort of volumes, um, it is a business within a business, okay? But I've got brokers in my office who write $20 million a year, um, they have um, a good work-life balance, and they have two to 300 clients. So again, this isn't about saying that one particular model is better than another. This isn't about comparing one broker to another. This is about working on a model that actually works for you and a business structure that actually works for you. A lot of the things we're going to talk today are around about fairly generic principles that you can look to apply to your business, but there'll be some examples that I give you today that effectively work for my brokerage, but my brokerage is a very large brokerage and we'll talk about that in a second. But before we continue, um, I wanted to give you a little bit of background of my, for those who I haven't met or that I don't know, uh, the lens that I'm coming to, to speak to you uh, through today. Um, I'm uh, a managing director of a brokerage firm. I'm not a broker. Um, I've got my you know, diplomas and uh, degrees, but I don't see clients and write business. What I do do is I look after two different trading brands that have a variety of different brokers. Everywhere from Mark and Kevin, uh, you have an agent uh, in our industry who are prolific high level loan writers, to normal broker models that sit around that 20 to $30 million um, uh, mark as well. I have new entrants. At the moment, I've got four uh, brokers uh, under uh, 18 months. Uh, all of who have had gone through a, a training academy that we've taken them through. Uh, their results vary from around about 35 million in their first year to around about 50 million in their first year. So through effective good process and training, they've been able to put those things in play to actually drive good business outcome. So again, the lens that I speak to you today is not through uh, that of a broker. It is through someone who mentors, trains and teaches brokers to be better business owners and therefore better brokers. So my background. Um, 
I love surfing. Um, my accountant told me that if I put a surfing picture in, uh, I can claim my surfing trips as tax deductions. Um, but uh, I don't think my accountant's very good. So um, my background, uh, I've, uh, I've been 20 years at ANZ. Um, I left ANZ back through 2012. During that time, I ran a number of different uh, businesses there from private banking. I was a director there. Um, I ran one of the retail divisions um, uh, through uh, what they called the Affluent Program, which sort of sits between retail and private bank. Um, I've been a lender, I've gone through you know, equity based um, uh, divisions etc. So what do I do now? Um, I run the Australian Lending Investment Centre, uh, many of you will know that name. Uh, it's an investment focused uh, business where we look at established properties, uh, to, uh, we look at uh, debt structure and strategy and how we create wealth with our clients. Um, I also uh, manage uh, professional mortgage managers, a more traditional broker model, uh, a wide variety of skill sets. Um, I've got guys and girls in there that do everything from institutional and corporate size debt uh, all the way through to um, focusing on things like asset finance as well. So a really good mix. Um, my ALEC guys, ALIC, um, they are office bound. Uh, they'll see their clients uh, at our office only. I don't have them out on the road. Um, I get asked a lot of the times about how Mark can write those sort of numbers. Well, Mark just works 90 hours a week. He sees all of his clients in the office and he does 40 appointments on average per week, every week. So if I've got him out on the road, he can't see his client base doing those sort of numbers on that sort of uh, occurrence. So again, different models. My PMM guys see me in a time and place of my choosing. They're more mobile, um, they're more agile, uh, and they, have, they offer a diversified uh, service offering. Okay. Um, we obviously won some awards along the way. Um, we've been very uh, effective and very quick to build our business, which was established back in 2009. Uh, and we've continued to grow year on year through, uh, being really critical on what we do and how we do it, focusing heavy on our people and our culture, and being very refined in our processes. So we'll talk some more about that as well. Um, I'm also now running a course called Broker Essentials. Um, it was established uh, late last year. We've actually started rolling it out uh, in June 2017, which has already happened. Um, we've worked with a number of connected brokers. We've got some more programs coming up in September, October, November in Victoria and New South Wales. So I'll talk to you a little bit uh, to, uh, about that towards the end as well. So again, setting the scene, um, it's all too hard. Uh, at the moment, uh, that's the number one complaint I'm getting from brokers across the board. Uh, everything's hard. We have a bit of a mantra in our office at the moment, everything is 25% less fun uh, and everything's 25% harder. Um, it is a real struggle at the moment and we don't sit there and try and pretend that it's not. A lot of things have slowed down, consumer sentiment is variable, market commentary is negative. So when we look at all those sort of things, we start to look at where the opportunity actually lies. So uh, as I was saying to a couple of the participants that are here this morning, uh, this is a real opportunity to go from good to great. Um, there will be a time in the coming 12 to 18 months where we will start to see some consolidation of our industry. I think you'll start to see a larger number of brokers start to leave the industry as it gets harder, as competition through a variety of different channels um, starts to strengthen. Uh, while I was away, I saw the launch of a particular brand that starts saying they're going to be developing a 20 minute online home loan. I think, great. That's good, that's not my particular market. Uh, that will service a very small percentage of the market. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how many of those loans actually get referred out. Um, and realistically, the, what's the default rate on those, uh, those type of clients actually seeking advice without any interaction, what that looks like in three and four or five years time. Why I'm interested in those sort of things is that one of the critical parts of the industry that a broker actually plays is, is advice. We are educators, we are advisors. The end result of what we do ends up being a mortgage or a loan, but the reality is your clients are seeking advice from you. So once that advice disappears, I'll be really interested to see what those end consumers end up looking like. Um, I'm more of the opinion that when uh, you're the naughty kid with the, uh, there was an experiment done years ago watching, um, you put a child in a room with a bit of candy on the table and say, look, there's one piece of candy on the table. If you wait five minutes, you can have two pieces of candy. Right? and you watch the child in the room just basically sweating bullets and then eventually they'll just grab that one piece because they can't resist. I see things like online financial services in a lot of the same sort of categories. If I can get a higher loan, I don't have to speak to them, I'll just get a little bit higher, a little bit higher. Even though I know I shouldn't, um, I will. Right? Consumerism, consumption, it's a really interesting time for our economy at the moment and I think we play a really critical role in educating people and sometimes actually saying no. It's not always about yes. So 
there is a video that I've got here. I'm not sure that it actually will play today. And I actually, I won't go through it because it runs for about three minutes. Do yourselves a favour uh, when you get a chance after this, uh, this session. Uh, do look up on YouTube. Um, uh, if you type in um, uh, Middle Eastern guys changing tyres on two wheels, um, there'll be a whole stack of searches come up. This is one of my favourites. Um, what this basically uh, denotes and why I use this reference is that um, one of the biggest challenges for brokers as small business owners is the decision about how you're going with your business. Do you stop your business to actually go and restart everything and rework all your processes? Or do you have to still keep driving down the road at 100 kilometres an hour changing two wheels? Because right? that's effectively what we've done. We'd love to be able to stop our business, but we can't. We've got large overheads, I've got 40 odd staff, we've got rent and expenses and I've got to pay for staples and paper and all sorts of things. So we can't stop our business. So we need to make a decision about how we go and what chunks we bite off so we can address certain particular things at certain times. So again, when we look at this particular analogy, have a think about your particular business. How do you actually continue to evolve and grow without stopping? Right? It's one of the real big challenges of any small business owner. So that's setting the scene today. So why is this important? Here's a big number. 50% of brokers fail in the first 18 months. You'll have seen this number bandied around in, the, in our media over the last sort of 12 months. Um, I actually personally believe this number is actually a little bit larger than that. Um, I'd actually like to throw it out to the room and, and to those online. Um, why do you guys think brokers fail in that time period, whether that be the first 12 months or the first 18 months? What are some of the reasons why brokers fail, do you think? Cash flow. Not enough cash flow, haven't uh, have entered in thinking that business starts you know, in the first, when I draw my first loan down, I get paid straight away. We know that's not the case. What else? Not enough clients. Yeah, so where do I actually get my clients from? We're going to touch on that today a little bit, but that's a really fascinating one. So what else? They think it's going to be easier than what it actually is. This is a tough industry. As I said, 15,400 plus brokers, over 6,000 brokerages. You've got over 8,000 bank staff distributing what effectively is a homogenous product. One product off the shelf, it comes in blue, red, yellow, light blue. I mean, it's not sexy, all right? So what is it that means that they're gonna to come to you? What does your client value proposition actually look like? What are some of the other reasons you think? Chantel, what are the guys online saying today? Um, lack of support and education, not enough product knowledge making a full-time commitment, no plan, dealing with lenders. Yes, okay, um, yes, yes, yes. Um, now again, you know, we, we, we're, I say we're just guys in the room, I'm not sure how many online, I think Chantel said there's six or 700 people online, so I'll be careful about what I say, but I do get scared when I hear things like, um, but it's okay, because when I'm not busy being a broker, I'll be an Uber driver, right? And I sit there and go, right. Um, that's not good, uh, or I'm doing this job and then I just want to do this on the side. Okay? For me, as I said, after spending 25 years in finance, um, being, you know, cut me and I bleed effectively finance industry, um, that really hurts my feelings. Um, we are custodians of a very long journey for our clients and we are absolutely critical in their ability not just to create wealth but obviously to ensure that their debt levels are correct. Um, we play a critical education role. So I don't believe that anyone can do that part time. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about change and what that means to our industry today. Uh, but with the rapid rate of change, I don't see how anyone can do this, this job part time. Yes, dealing with lenders is a really interesting point. That's about relationships and communication, which we'll talk about. Um, but when you're talking about things like clients, um, we're talking about the client journey. The faster road to yes, all right, is not always about yes, and it's not always about faster. So we're going to talk about that now. So I'm going to take you through seven um, of the roadblocks that we see um, in commonality. Uh, we see these things all the time, and these are just 101s. You will know them, but what are you doing about them? So the first one is, and I could ask this 100 times, and you guys will give me all the same answers, and you'll all sit there and nod your head. You know what the problem is, right? Generally, it's called the knowing doing gap. All right. Now, I won't ask if you smoke and I won't ask if you drink, but if you smoke, you know you shouldn't. If you drink too much, you know you shouldn't. Virgin Active Gym, for who, those who aren't in Melbourne, is downstairs from this building. I was there yesterday suspending my membership for another three months, um, knowing that I shouldn't. All right. I know I shouldn't, but I do it anyway. All right. When it comes to efficiencies, when it comes to process, when it comes to calling back my client when I said that I would, when it comes to um, uh, submitting a deal late at night instead of the next... I know I should, but I don't. 
These are choices. So when we look at some of the things that we do, a lot of it relates back to a behavioural change. Your cognitive thinking. How much information can I hold up here before I go into overwhelm and I can't think anymore and I start making bad decisions? The knowing doing gap applies to all industries. I know I should call 30 clients this week, I called five. I know that I should send out some more content on my social media, I didn't. I know that I should and I don't. Okay, so you actually need to be really honest with yourself. A lot of the things that are in our industry and when we talk about a faster time to yes, is caused at the front end. It's actually caused by us and our communication and our processes. So we're going to talk a lot about that today. So the knowing doing gap is a real big bugbear for me. Um, I generally call it root cause. Uh, what was the root cause of the problem? What happened? What did we do? What didn't we do? And then I ask the overarching question of why did we do it? Right? Why did we make a conscious decision to not do this particular part of the process? Right? And then we break it down and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Roadblock number two. Um, this is a big one for me. Quality at a cost. What do I mean by that? Um, over the last 12 months, as I was uh, developing the Broker Essentials program, one of the things I did, I spent a lot of time with some of the major banks and their process areas to understand what we are delivering to them. What is our submission quality actually look like? One of the major banks come back to me and said that, and there's a, obviously a lot of, large amount of data that sits behind it, but 60% of applications that came from brokers required rework. 60% of applications from brokers required rework. So when we talk about feedback from online that came back before, talking about, yes, dealing with lenders is a bit of a pain sometimes, I can tell you that lenders think that dealing with brokers can be a pain too. Right? As an ex-banker and as now someone in our industry, I see both sides of the fence. I look at the lens and understand that there are both sides that I need to understand how they're processing, what they're doing, how do they feel. Submission quality at a cost, basically, though, is all around time. Right? A faster time to yes. Um, Chantel? Just an online question. Rework means that they had to actually touch the application uh, twice, i.e. straight through processing right, means that you've provided 100% of the information, whether that be an approval in principle uh, and it's subject to versus it just be a straight refinance or a purchase and you've got everything, that the lender is actually only touching it once. Right? So a rework means an exception has been raised and it needs to be addressed to go back to the queue again and then be reassessed. Okay? So that's a significant amount. Um, I don't like hearing those numbers because I know that from my business we will generally be causing those problems. Okay? So we'll talk a little bit about knowledge gap as well in a second though. But quality to cost comes also from your time. When you are in a rush to submit your deal and just getting it in and then having to come back to it again and potentially a third or a fourth time is not just denigrating your client experience, it's actually wasting your time and your hourly rate. Right? You've got to remember what you're charging out. If you're doing a $100,000 sub loan, getting paid 65 points up front plus a bit of trail, um, and you're spending 10 hours, 15 hours, 20 hours on that deal, you've now made no money on that deal. I'm always interested to hear when people talk about the money that's earned in our industry, and I go, yeah, that's gross. What about costs? What about time, resources, tax, etc.? And all of a sudden, that $6,500 on a million dollar deal that you get up front isn't six and a half grand anymore. So you need to start whittling that away to understand what your real costs are, and we'll talk about that in a second. So what's below the surface? This is talking about the quality of your applications. I was listening to, um, I don't read a lot, I listen to books. Um, I'm, I don't have a lot of time to, to read, so I, I spend a time in the car or at work and have earphones in. There was an interesting quote last night saying that it's interesting with mortgage brokers, uh, when you get an application, uh, a new application has a lot of what on it? It's got blank boxes. And those boxes are actually meant to have things filled out and put in them. So when we submit things with blank boxes that have meant to have uh, stuff in them, and we wonder why uh, they come back with an exception. Okay, so again, quality control, and we'll talk a little bit about that today as well, is a critical part of the process. Another part of um, uh, where I see uh, the faster time to yes being an issue is uh, getting the monkey off your back. Um, you're too busy doing what? Okay. When I, what I mean by that basically is that as a one-man band, you are a jack of all trades. You are everything said from HR to marketing to sales to compliance to risk to process, etc. In larger organisations or those that have support staff, this is about maximising your efficiencies and using your time effectively. 
So one of the biggest problems is when you're too busy doing something else and you're not putting enough value in your processes, uh, you will spend more time reworking your deals uh, than spending in time in front of clients. I found that once you get your head in a file and once you start actually trying to fix exceptions and chase, 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 because you didn't set the scene well up front, the time effectively exponentially increases. And all of a sudden, again, if you look at your hourly rate, those particular deals can actually be losing you money. So again, you need to be pretty brutal on this sort of stuff. So again, when I say time doing what, or busy doing what, getting the monkey off your back is about thinking about the resources that you employ. Is it worth, so uh, there are brokerages out there and large institutions that do stuff offshore, they might do $30 a file. Uh, it might be about you using a shared resource. I know that I've got some brokers in here in the room today that are from larger brokerages that have got support staff. It's actually about letting go and giving those files over and letting your staff do their job and not getting involved. Mark, as a good example, does not do anything outside of the client interview. Everything from the analytics, pulling the file together, the processes, all are done by all our staff. You can't write those numbers and see those clients and service your existing base when you're chasing paperwork, when you're doing anything else but advising the client because that is where your value is. Change. Um, we talk about change positive sometimes. We also talk about in its negatives. Um, too much, too fast, too often. The ability to keep up with change at the moment is a skill in its own. Um, there are somewhere in the order of 428 lenders out there. Most of you will deal with, let's call it 5 to 12. Um, Connectors panel has somewhere in the order of mid-40s. Um, so we know that at all of those institutions, there is constant change and review happening at this stage. So again, when it comes to change, how are you keeping up with change? What's good to know? What's nice to know? What do you must know? How do you catalogue and store change? Remember, your cognitive thinking, your brain tank, you only have so much. If you were to think of your brain tank as a glass of water, what happens when it starts to overflow? Okay, you will get to a point where you can only store and make good decisions with so much information. We call it going into meltdown or into overflow. Uh, at our office, when we know that people are under stress or pressure, um, their decision making starts to go a little bit sideways once their brain tank is full. And in fact, the good decisions that they were making start to turn bad as well because you go into emotional meltdown almost. So when it comes to change, and I know that I get from my business all the back channel, I see a majority of different things that come through. We get all the stuff that comes from the lenders. We get stuff that comes from our, fa our fantastic um, aggregator connective. We get all their, and I sit there and go, wow, how are people digesting this, right? Um, how do you best learn? So again, change is a really interesting one for what we do and how we go about running our, our business. This one's always an interesting one for me. Um, speed. It's not all about speed and sometimes we overcommit. Okay. Um, to me, our industry is about quality. Our destination is defined by our conversations that we have by our client and the speed in which we commit to. Um, too often at the moment, our industry is very much about speed. It's got to be done quick now, overnight, 15 minutes, 20 minute home loans. When did that happen? Okay. For the last 25 years that I've been in the industry, one of the biggest concerns that I have is that we've been miseducating or, or uneducating our consumers by telling them that they need it quickly. No one generally gets into the market on a Thursday and says, my God, I need to buy a house tomorrow. Cognitively, they've been thinking it for six and 12 months prior and they've been making these decisions a long time ago. So our job is to get in front of those clients quicker. We do normal SIAs, we don't have to push anything and away we go and it's all nice and happy. But because we're educating the customer out there saying, oh, we'll be faster, 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 we're actually not doing our industry any favours. So when it comes to speed, what we do and, and what I teach at Broker Essentials is that we take our clients on a journey, we share responsibility and accountabilities on agreed timeframes. And we'll talk about some of those solutions in a second, but it's not all about speed. If we look at, uh, I wrote a, an article the other day talking about um, very few things in life where faster doesn't give you more risk, whether that be driving, preparing food, uh, the faster you go, generally, the more risk is associated with it. So again, however, if you set the speed with the client, customer experience is going to be fine. Right? If you set your expectations, you will delight your clients. If you set your expectations too fast, in an industry at the moment especially that's not fast, 
uh, then you're going to have real problems. Um, I don't see it getting faster anytime soon. So when we talk about averaging 10 days to pick up a loan or a deal, that's a real problem. Okay, fast isn't part of that. Uh, um, uh, I hear that a lot sometimes, um. Uh, interesting enough that when it came to things like the quality of our submissions and what we're submitting up to the banks, one of the things that I do stress, we are in the finance industry. You need to know finance, i.e. how to read a payslip. I've got to admit um, that I do obviously vet and check a number of our deals. We do somewhere in the order of a couple of, hundred, a couple of thousand deals a year uh, and I'm in a lot of those deals having a look at what they are and how we're processing, what the experience looks like. And I have seen thousands of different payslips. So I admit that I have trouble sometimes reading payslips because they look like a whole variety of different things. I can read financials, I'm not an accountant, but I'm reasonable at it. I'd probably rate myself five or six, um, but I know that guys and girls out there that might rate themselves seven or eight, but would really struggle to read financials. I remember seeing a banker one day many years ago shoving a tax return, uh, a company tax return into a fax machine, faxing it off to credit, and when I asked her, what are you doing? And she said, I'm submitting a deal to credit. And I said, you're just faxing the financials, yeah? Yeah, I'm doing my submission. And I go, that's not a submission. You're just getting someone at the end of a fax machine or, or an email to actually assess the deal for you. Do you understand DSR and UMI and LVR? Do you understand how that actually works? The majority of our industry is requiring more in that space. We actually do need to do more training around understanding financials because, again, when we look at the reworks that are getting done, the amount of loans that are going through uh, as unservicing or not servicing is huge because we're not reading the financials correctly. Your customer, remember, doesn't know what they don't know. So, you know, Jason, how much do you earn? Or well, I earn $100,000. Okay, well, I've got your payslip here. It says, yes, you get 100, but then there's super, you've got a hex debt, you've actually got this uh, voluntary um, uh, contribution into a home loan scheme through Defence for. Ah, okay, you earn 73000 right? That's what the bank wants to know. So again, it doesn't look good if we're submitting deals up that we don't know from day one what we're actually doing. It makes us look bad, all right? It makes you look bad, and it starts to create a bad relationship with your institutions that you're dealing with. So again, more training in financials is a definite thing. There's lots of programs out there that, um, that look at financial data. The last one of, the, of these problems that I look at is generally is inconsistency. Everything's on the fly. I don't have a process for. It's the first time I've done. Um, I was talking to someone the other day and they were saying a good example was, you know, they went to, they had a, a major operation the other day um, and they were getting surgery done and they were introduced to the doctor and the doctor was super excited and he said, wow, you, you know, you're up and about. Uh, and the doctor said, well, it's my first day, this is actually my first operation. And I went, wow, okay, not necessarily what I want to hear as a patient. If I'm going into open heart surgery, this is your first, okay. Uh, what I'm looking for is confidence and experience, okay. Now, you don't necessarily have to be in our industry for 25 years to have confidence and experience. What you do have to do is have great processes in place. So when we talk about it's on the fly, if you're specialising in non-conforming, um, I know that I deal with a guy called Stuart Stiles down in Cheltenham, a fantastic broker out there who does non-conforming deals. I sent a couple to him the other day who actually called through to our office because I said, we don't do these, we're not good at them, but I know someone who actually is very good at them. He has an incredible process. He's going to look after you. Now, we just gave those clients away. Um, we don't take any commission splits. That's not what it's about because of what I wanted those clients was to be delighted by our industry, and they were. So if you're in construction or you're in first home buyers or you're in off the plan or you're in investments like what we do, you need to be very good at what you do. You need your processes nailed. The first thing that breaks down when you don't follow your process is the customer experience. Okay, so the worse your customer experiences are, you'll generally break it back down and you pull it all apart, you'll find that you didn't follow the processes. So what's the reality check? So guys, where do you spend the majority of your time at the moment? Especially for some of the newer guys, um, there are some more experienced people in the room, guys online and girls online. Where do you spend the majority of your time when you're doing your processing? Are you chasing the customer? Researching. Chasing paperwork, filling out paperwork? What are you actually doing? Researching researching deals, so you're actually looking into which banks of the 6 or 12 or 24 or 100 that you're looking at. Where else? Loading applications. Loading the CRM, so whether it be CRM or AOL, where else? Does anyone know, so online's a good one, I mean we could do a poll, we won't do one, I mean I know the answer because I do the testing. Um, 
It's interesting, uh, what, uh, how long does it take you to load a deal end to end in AOL? So it's in CRM, you've seen the client, you've got your data punched in, you've used the client portal, um, information's looking pretty good, it transfers across into AOL. Right? How long does it take you now to load a deal, to get all your crosses to ticks on average? 45 minutes to two hours? 30 minutes. 30 minutes? One to two hours. One to two hours. It's a huge amount of time for data entry. But it's a really critical juncture. That is your story that you're telling to the bank. Information needs to be correct. So how did you get to that stage? Uh, how did you make sure that the information that you put in is correct? There's uh, areas that we've created at, at the business and, and areas that I take uh, uh, participants through in Broker Essentials around things like checklists, where we've created checklists specifically for certain banks, specifically for certain processes, because uh, our, either our tech or our CRM doesn't do certain things. So a good example for CRM is that you might have dependents, obviously, a lot of people have got kids, that doesn't necessarily, that information doesn't transfer over from CRM into AOL. If you've got your ages of your dependents listed in Mercury, it doesn't transfer those ages across into, uh, into, CR, into AOL. Sorry. What it'll do, it'll give you a couple of boxes, but they'll have zeros in them. Now, if you don't check that box, it's still going to go tick for green, but when you get to your assessor, your assessor will say it's non-disclosure, they've got dependents. I can see school fees or I can see daycare or whatever it is. Um, there are a number of examples like that where you need to be very careful about the data that you're actually doing. Hex debts is another really good one. It gets missed quite a bit undisclosed and non-disclosed credit cards. Okay? All those sort of things where you need to be careful uh, when you're transferring your data if your processes aren't clear. So where do I see a majority of brokers spending their time? Uh, pushing back on the bank and the customer or pushing back to the bank and the customer. Uh, fixing exceptions. The amount of time, so whenever you get an exception, what do you do about it? Do you go and actually have a look at it? Do you go and understand why you actually had the exception or do you just fix the exception? Chasing documents. Uh, there's a variety of different things like um, uh, bankstatements.com.au, I think it is. Uh, there's uh, Easy Docs. There's all sorts of programs out there about doc collection. But we're still a long, long way away from customers feeling free to just centralise all their documents into a portal or the cloud so that we can grab out what we need. So we do spend a lot of time chasing documents. But we don't necessarily set the scene well. Reading updates on policy changes. I know that I spend a significant amount of my week actually reading about what the changes mean and mean to our business. So how do you keep abreast of that? And wondering effectively where your time goes. Um, oh, it's Friday. How did that happen? Okay. And all of a sudden, I'm not prepared for next week. I start preparing for next week on Monday when really preparing for next week as my process was this Thursday. Right? Where did my time go? You need to be brutal with your time. So where should you spend your time? We're educators. That's our job. Our job is to advise and educate. I see it as nothing else. I would love a, a, a time when we don't do um, mortgages or broking at all. Um, I'm happy for the client to go and execute on a portal that gives them what they need after I've given them advice. I don't have to push the paperwork around. I just press a button, but they pay for the advice. I mean, that's the, that's the ideal world I'd love to have, right? because that's the real value. Straight through processing. Now, we don't do straight through processing all the time either. We have a lot of complex clients. Uh, there are a number of times that we will have deals that don't just go straight through. Um, there are certain things we don't do. Uh, we don't do uh, company uh, checks, so director sh directorships, so um, we don't go and search those. We don't see enough uh, clients that would warrant me to go and get a license so I can do company searches. Uh, we don't do title searches, okay? But what we do is a process in place to make sure if we're getting a rates notice that we're at least eliminating enough of the percentages that 95% of my deals will get captured through that process and then I'm not too worried about um, uh, if a client has uh, a variance on their title because it will get picked up through the, the loan process. So when it comes to things like title searches, ask another question. For those in Victoria, and we've got obviously uh, there's a number of brokers in the room today, if I'm buying a property in Camberwell or Kew um, and it's a, uh, an apartment, like an older style apartment, I'll ask another question. So Jason, I don't know if you'd know what that question would be yet, but that question would generally be, interesting, nice property, fantastic, have you got a carport? Yes, cool. Is it on a separate title? Because a lot of the banks will only pick that up at certification stage. And guess what? That's two days before settlement. And all of a sudden they say, hey, where's the other title? And you go, oh God, back to assessment, new docs, rush, 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 bad customer experience. You've got to remember, your customer will only remember the end of the experience. They generally don't remember the start. Getting your clients to do more of the heavy lifting, right? 
This isn't about them self-serving. This is about them actually understanding the process. So when we look at this, I look at those sort of things and go, right, your customer needs to be set better expectations about what you do, about what they need to do, and what about the agreed timelines. So I'll give you another example of that in a second. And be an expert in your field, right? You need to be an expert. No longer in our industry is good okay. You need to be great. The next 12 uh, to 18 months, we are going to need to ensure that our profession, our profession, right, is best of breed. We are better than the next industry, which is general banking. All right. Now again, as someone who spent 20 years at a bank, um, and I love my institution, uh, I don't denigrate their experience, they offer a certain service, they don't do what we do. They don't do what we do. All right. So we need to treat ourselves like a profession. We need to be better educated, more professional, and we need to strive for what our industry will look like in the next five and 10 years and make it sustainable. So knowing why your business runs like a well-oiled machine. So understanding, as I said at the start, of the 2.1 million small business owners in this country, that I don't just understand that one hour, that I'm good at understanding the difference between lines of credits and variable and fixed and interest only and particular products. That one hour, that's fantastic. But what about running my business? Do I understand everything about my business? So as we move through to some of the solutions, one of the things that we do uh, in Broker Essentials is we talk a lot about the results ladder, about shifting your mindset. In the early days, especially with some of the newer brokers in the room, in the newer, uh, the newer brokers will focus very heavily on sales activity. They'll do, 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 they'll say yes, yes, yes a lot and they'll be busy, busy, busy. Okay? As their results start to move up, they start increasing their skills, their activity starts to get steady, they start to get reliable clients coming in. But as you start moving up and riding 40, 50 and $60 million a year, you can't do that doing the same activities. You can't do it with the same mindset. So as your mindset changes and the, your, your business results change, you shift from a sales mentality to a process mentality. But what I mean by that is that when I talk about Mark as an example, Mark doesn't make um, uh, cold calls, we don't do social media, we don't do above the line advertising, we don't do any marketing whatsoever. Mark's all about process. Process, process, process. Delivering outstanding results, fantastic advice, and delighting our clients. Because we know that 66% of our business comes from, now in our case, the industry average is 66%. Our case, it's around about 85 to 90% of our business comes from referrals. We get about one or 2% of our clients that come in over firewalls and through a variety of other sources. But of that sort of 90 odd percent that comes from referrals, 40 odd percent comes from um, business partners, but the other 50-odd you know, percent comes from uh, existing clients. So we know we have to delight our clients. So by moving from being a salesman to just having outstanding processes, now when I say processes I don't mean just processing an application, I mean everything is a process. How we approach our day, your time, everything is a process. So, some solutions. For the last couple of minutes, before we get into some open questions in the last five or, five or ten minutes, the three hot principles that we run by. One is, of course, process. Uh, in our office, um, the mantra is process, process, process. Um, if you come into my office, you'll see uh, process maps on the wall and you'll see things broken down when we have an error. We'll see how it's all been broken back down and where we failed our process. Everything is a process. Um, in, our, in, in our business, we literally have hundreds and hundreds of process maps. We have process guides, we have training manuals, all developed around particular parts of our business and our expertise that lead back to our customer experience. So how many processes do you have? What is your most critical process? How good is your process? What other industries have you compared your process to? Through what lens did you see your process? Your lens or the customer's lens? Right. How did you see your processes? Two, measure and manage. We measure and manage everything. Right. And what I mean by that is that we actually, like an athlete, um, we want to improve all the time and we're talking about milliseconds. We are always looking at how do we constantly improve. Every month we measure somewhere in the order of just over 80 different measurements. So we understand everything from uh, how when we're processing uh, an AIP and we lodge the application through to conditional approval, how many days it takes with a particular bank to get there. I know certain staff how long they take to get documents back for clients. I can measure how many interviews that all of my brokers have had, whether they be 15 minute phone appointments, 30 minute catch ups or full one hour appointments. We measure everything. How many things do you measure? Okay. 
And the last one is the customer journey. Um, when we talk about the customer journey, we're talking about the full end-to-end, -end, not just when you start that first appointment in that golden hour and not just when it settles. I'm talking about full end-to-end -end customer journey. How do you map it? How does your customer see it? What are you committing to? What is your client committing to? Have you actually got a very clear client value proposition? So your customer journey is absolutely critical. So when it comes to things like a faster time to yes, having a really clear process in place is critical. Nine times out of 10, our problems start at our end with us or our client before it gets to the bank. I know the banks do have challenges. I know that their processes aren't always infallible, but most of the time the processes errors start at our end. We can be better and we need to be better. Measure and manage when it comes to faster time to yes. This is understanding about what your capabilities are. So all of a sudden, when it's taking you one or two hours to process a loan, you need to potentially get better at that because what will happen is you'll start thinking about selling and all of a sudden you're making errors on your process and you're just trying to jam the actual application into AOL and shoot it off, it'll be okay, but I'll send it into CBA and I don't have my upfront val. So it actually doesn't get to assessment because it doesn't get past pre-assessment. Right? So again, understand the processes, measure everything that you do and have a really clear client journey. When I talk about is fast coming at a cost, yes it is because there's a good example when we're in the bank that uh, when you uh, lose your visa card, you lose it and you report it lost on Monday. They say to you, no problems, uh, we'll return Chantel your card, you'll get it on Thursday. Chantel's card arrives on Wednesday. Is Chantel any more really delighted than she would be if it was on the Thursday? Yeah, maybe a couple of percent. She's not overly happy, but yep, she got it, fantastic, problem solved. The card arrives on Friday. Chantel hits the roof. You said Thursday. I'd planned everything around Thursday. Oh my God, the Ombudsman's getting involved, all right? That's how we react, it's natural. So again, when we overcommit a faster time to yes, what's the fast actually look like? Fast could be 45 days. Right? It's what you determine fast looks like. So, um, your next steps. Uh, today, uh, as I said, I'm presenting to you on behalf of uh, the Australian Lending Investment Centre and Professional Mortgage Managers, my two businesses that I run, and obviously also on behalf of uh, Broker Essentials, uh, a course and a program that I'm running to help brokers effectively reach their next steps. So today um, I do have some materials um, that we're happy to give out. I know that uh, Chantel will be sending out an, the ebook. Uh, that's already gone out, has it Chantel? Hasn't yet. So Chantel will be sending that out. Um, there's some additional materials that I've got around podcasts and white papers and, uh, and articles, etc. So what you can do, if you uh, text uh, that number, if you text brokers and your name, not my name of course, brokers, uh, your email address and your last name, um, we'll actually send out some more additional materials uh, to help you uh, on your journey. Um, we've actually got our next program uh, running in September, on the 7th of September in Melbourne, uh, and then I've got one in October, and then Sydney in, uh, in November, and another one in, um, uh, in Melbourne in November. For those of you interstate in Queensland, SA and, um, and uh, WA, um, if you are interested in the course, do touch base with me. Um, we are looking at um, some programs interstate. And if there's anyone from Tassie, um, if you're MFAA, I'm actually down there on the 17th um, of August doing a presentation as well. So please feel free to come along uh, and we can have a bit of a chat about that as well. So I love this one. Uh, w. Edwards Deeming uh, passed away in 1993. Um, he was the master of um, uh, process efficiency, um, incredible uh, uh, management consultant. If you can't describe what you are doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. Okay. Um, I can't. Oh, contact us again. Yep. No, no, there we go. Um, I love that quote. Um, I think that's one of my favourites. Um, I know that if you said, if you ever come up and visit our business, and, and you're all welcome to, not all at once, but you're welcome to come up and see us. Um, uh, our guys, you, my guys are beaten to death with process, and they will tell you that um, because it's what I can rely on. In an industry that requires regimented approach to things, process is king. So again, when it comes to the ability to get everything done in your day, follow processes, follow processes. I know it's ad nauseum, but follow some more processes. Create some new ones, right? Think differently about what you're doing. It doesn't have to be the same. What works for my business won't necessarily work for your business as well. So, time for change.
Um, I took this slide, um, uh, there's some readings that I'm doing at the moment around uh, red ocean, blue ocean strategies. This is a really good one as an example. Um, when we talk about our industry, we're talking about actually going to a market that doesn't exist, creating demand where demand doesn't currently exist. Right. At the moment, with 15,400 brokers out there, there's plenty of average brokers just transacting. Don't be that guy or girl. Be better than that. So time to change means you need to really have a good hard look at your business. Again, to hit, we're here today to talk about how to get a faster time to yes. I'd actually push back on that. Uh, it's not faster right, and it's not always yes. Don't always jump at every deal. Um, there are some deals that I've seen over the last few years that I know I had a broker in my office that chased effectively non-conforming. The problem with that, he wasn't very good at it. And then when he eventually got to a solution for his clients, those clients would refer five or six more non-conforming friends and he'd take another several months to get through only a few deals. The average mortgage broker writes between 20 to 40 deals a year, between nine to $15 million in drawdowns. You don't have time to be inefficient. So you need to have a really good think about the market that you operate in and where you spend your time and your focus. So sometimes that actually might be about saying no and fast is not our core strength. It's not the bank's core strength. It never has been. So I'm always interested to see how we got too fast. Right? Fast is a perception. Fast food. I want the McDonald's drive through experience. What we offer as an industry should be the Nobu experience. The quality experience that's around the, the uh, delighting our client over a longer period of time, a memorable experience. Very rarely in our industry do I hear things like, wow, check out my mortgage documents. They are beautiful, aren't they? No, it's have a look at my two-storey house and my three-car garage and my pool or my next investment property. We are effectively looking at how we create and, and deliver to the dreams of our clients. We're not just pushing paperwork around. So if you want to be remembered as the guy or girl who just delivers some paperwork, you'll be easily forgotten. If you're providing great advice and a delightful experience through great processes, understanding your business and a clearly defined client journey, then that is a business that you can be proud of and that one, that will be sustainable. So thank you for your time today. Um, we will open up the floor to some questions. Um, we've also got everyone online as well if they've got questions, Chantelle, so please feel free. I think we've got about 10 minutes to go and, uh, and away we go. So guys and girls. What is the best advice you have for a new sole operator coming out of banking, single best piece of advice? Go back to banking. So no, I'm okay. um, uh, that's, a that's a fascinating question uh, because we are seeing a substantial amount of people leave the banking industry because A, um, they're not as engaged as they want to be. Um, the culture of the industry has actually changed. Um, if, uh, the best bit of advice is forget your banking roots. Um, when you are corporatised, um, one of the biggest challenges of coming out of banking is thinking that clients will just come to you and where your real value was when you were in a bank. Sometimes the real value was just above the door. It had a big logo above it and it was yellow, it was blue, it was red, and you actually didn't have as much value as you thought you did. So you actually have to have a really big departure in your mindset. You have to work 10 times harder. The $100 million writer that comes out of a bank generally struggles to write $10 million in the real world because the clients just don't walk in. Right? Their relationships were actually hinged on being at the bank, not actually on their individual service proposition. So again, um, de-link de, de your mindset, um, be super excited about coming into an industry where you've got much more control about what you do, um, but you need to sort of decorporatize yourself. Can you throw out your contact details again? I can. There's the contact details on the bottom there, but um, if you're looking at the... the big one. That one? Yeah. That's for the additional resources. What else, guys? Um, what tools or software do you use to create process maps? Great question. Uh, now, we're recording, so I won't tell you how I got them. Um, uh, one of the tools that I use is Visio. Um, Visio is a good one for doing swim lanes. Uh, you actually don't need Visio. Don't go and spend $1,000 on a program that um, is actually not that cool. Um, with the resources on our program, there are, there are tools that I give out in the program. Yes, are done through Visio, um, but I've actually found that you can just as well do them in PowerPoint. Um, you just need to set yourself up in a nice template. Again, in my program, uh, we give out those tools. Um, they're nice and easy to use and away you go. Uh, and then once you've got your swim lanes or your process maps in play, you need to convert the map into a usable manual. So th the way I write the manuals is, if I gave it to someone on the street today, they should be able to process a loan in about 45 minutes because they just have to follow the process. It will capture 85 to 90% of the clients. Someone else said Giphy is really good. 
yep, that's another good one as well. So, but again, you don't necessarily have to get too much caught in what it looks like. It depends. In my company, yes, where I have to go and present these to larger organisations or larger amounts of people, yes. Um, I think sometimes when you put lipstick on a pig, you've got to remember, it's still a pig. Okay? Um, don't have to get too cute with some of these things. Uh, I see a lot of people spending a lot of time when they should be focusing on uh, getting more clients. Someone just wanted to ask if you could repeat um, the average, what the average broker writes, so how many loans per year and what the broker Yep, the average broker on uh, industry average is between 20 and 40 loans per year, averaging between 9 to $15 million in drawdowns, which equates to around about an income around about 65000 gross. It's, so where they get these numbers from are $142,000 averages and that we're off playing golf and working three days a week uh, is beyond me. It's offensive. Um, this is a bloody tough industry doing an incredible job right? and you know, we're educating uh, what is a society that actually has very low education standards when it comes to financial fitness. So we do an incredible job and it's, it's quite insulting when I hear those, um, when I hear people denigrating what we do. Um, someone else has asked, do you support your brokers specialising rather than being general purpose? Another really good question. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, the question, sorry, uh, was around do I support brokers in my business being either specialists or being generalists? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, I've got specialists in my business. So uh, Mark, Kevin, um, Natasha, Kate, Dan and another Mark, my ILMs, focus on investment lending. We have a particular ratio that they are to do each year, so that looks around about 60-70% they're investment focused and the rest is generally uh, owner occupied or commercial or asset. Um, but I've got other guys and girls who are much more broad in what they do. So we have different core skills. Um, I've got one broker who specialises in things like um, uh, retirement home finance, so doing 15 and 20 and 25 million dollar deals, but they take 6 and 12 months. So you've got to also be careful about when you specialise in a particular field, like with investment, when investment rules change, how does that affect your industry? Right? So being a jack of all trade is good. Um, I do like to do less things well. Uh, I think you've got to be careful about being a jack of all trades, especially in a changing environment. Um, do you need to take a step back when you implement a new process? So do you, do you need to take a step back when you implement a new process? Uh, now, again, um, I'm lucky enough to be in an organisation where we're large enough to have a role in the company that runs the business. Um, there are other great businesses out there like uh, Otto Dargan up in Sydney at uh, Home Loan Experts or um, uh, Simon uh, and, uh, and David and, um, and the guys at Smart Move in Sydney, uh, Key Invest in South Australia. There is some acceptance finance, I've got one of the guys in the room here today, that run brilliant businesses because they've actually got someone actually running the business. So yes. I get the opportunity to take a step back. I get to see it from 10,000 feet, I get to see it from two feet. Um, and that's that going back to that slide of having um, uh, the being on two wheels. I think we've got that there somewhere. I think I'm right. There we go. Um, so do you stop your business? Uh, sometimes you need to do that. This is not a nine to five job. Do it after hours, do it on the weekend, get someone else to have a look at it. All right. But you do need to take a step back. You do need to get some, uh, to, to see if it makes sense because some things you will create in a frenzy uh, and they won't always work. But the beauty of being a small business owner, not a broker, a small business owner, is agility and the ability to test and learn. That's another thing you'll hear in my business a lot. We test and learn, test and learn, test and learn. Because you know what? If it doesn't work, we'll try something else. All right? That's the beauty of it. So back to your original question about why, what a banker should do when they come out of banking into broking, have fun. Test and learn. Um, you know, it doesn't take you two and a half years to get a client survey out to a client because it has to go through legal risk, compliance and marketing. You can just go into MailChimp and away you go. So, anyway, what else? Um, oh, that's a Mac or PC, that's one. Uh, <laughs> to be brutally honest, uh, on my desk, coming to my office, I got both. <laughs> um, to be, uh, so uh, Mac uh, I use for marketing um, because of the tools and software that I've got on there. I love my Mac. Um, uh, for uh, my connector software and for my day to day and email outlook, I use, uh, I use PC. Uh, but always, always dual screens. Um, how would you grow from sort of a one, there's a few questions around basically that threshold between when you need someone. Yep. So how do you know when to put someone on? Okay, so how do you, how do you know to, uh, to when to put someone on? Oh, we're, uh, hopefully we're going. We're not going. 
I'll show you. So in, uh, in here with your, there we go. Growing from a one-man band is a decision. Uh, it's a big decision. Um, what you've got to have a think about, have we passed it? There it is. Um, going from a one-man band to uh, requiring support, my personal opinion and from my experience over the last five or six years, it's around about 25 million. Once you're writing that number there, uh, you're not doing it on your own. Uh, now, you might start off with virtual assistants, uh, someone booking your diary, uh, someone controlling some of your emails, someone some compartmentalising your communications. The second part might be that you're, you've got someone processing your loans. It might be offshore. I know that some loan market, as an example, has for $30 they process the files that's data entry. Um, you might have end-to-end -end process offshore. You might have onshoring. I've got 15 staff in Melbourne who just process loans and take the client from lodgement through to post-settlement. I've got analysts who just put the file together in the credit notes to give back to the broker and say, from your diary note, which was done on Evernote, was this any good? Is this what you want? Yes, it is. Sign it off. And it goes to processing. So you need to start thinking about where in your processes you are most inefficient, where in your processes consume the most amount of your time, and what is the value of that time to be spending more in front of a client, not going off and playing golf or, you know, um, you know, working in your PJs out of your shed for two days a week. I mean, if you're going to go and invest in your business, make a real go of it. But again, the decision needs to be, do you actually want to grow? You can have very successful brokerages running at 20 or 30 or 40 million dollars, and that's all they want to write. I got asked recently what would be one of the things I would change as a business. I'd have got smaller, not bigger. Right? We wouldn't have got as big. It's more expensive. We have massive overheads. It's not necessarily more profit it's more revenue. Profit's more important. All right. So sometimes you've got to make choices and we've made choices that are around growth and size and the like. So. And what what would you say? I know you guys don't do marketing, mm -hmm. but if you did? Oh, we do a little bit, but not much. What, what, what is your kind of favourite? Oh, um, marketing is a really interesting one. To me, um, marketing is all about delighting your existing clients. Uh, if, I was, if I came into this industry, again, to, your, to the broker coming from banking, um, if you don't know 20 clients that you can delight straight away, don't come into broking. Those 20 to clients will deliver you 200 clients in the following couple of years. Focus on delighting, delighting, delighting those clients. That client journey is critical. Don't focus on, and again for us, um, the unknown. Social media is a tool, it's not a marketing strategy. Facebook is a tool, it is not a marketing strategy, nor is LinkedIn, nor any Twitter and the like. They are additional tools to, to help your content your, spread your message. Don't just expect that by putting up a Facebook ad that you're going to get hundreds of new clients walk in the door. It's if what, so what. They don't know you, they don't care about you, you've added no value to them, why would they come to you? So again, if I'm looking at marketing, uh, marketing to your existing client base. If I look at the tools that we use, uh, we're gold members for the Connect of My Marketing. Uh, we have constant messaging going out, little things like the My Birthday text, which everyone has a bit of a giggle at. Brilliant piece of marketing. It's so simple, it takes nothing to get across, but it comes out, clients are delighted, it's memorable. All right, hey, got a message from my broker, wow, I didn't even know he knew when my birthday was. The common feedback from that, uh, Chantel, for your marketing team, we actually get complaints. Ah, oh, complaints from the husband saying, hey, I forgot my wife's birthday, but you guys didn't. All right, so. <laughs> We've actually had a few come out of this, who is this from the husband? <laughs> Why are you wishing my wife happy birthday? Um, so again, don't, it's not always about the sexy. Right? Sometimes it's going back to the simplistic. Right? It's not always about advertising in the paper. Um, you know, there's some really interesting stuff. Get to work with people like the MPA and, and Momentum Media, so Key Media and Momentum. Um, they've got some great opportunities to go and tell your story, um, get some press out there, get some good quality imagery of yourself and your businesses. So uh, I do get a little horrified um, when I see on things like social media and LinkedIn, you know, selfies for profile pictures, or I saw one the other day of a guy in a tuxedo. I'm going, yep, that's not really landing. All right. Um, so again, think about it through your client lens about what they see. Okay. What else? So we, I think we're done for today, guys. So uh, for everyone online, thank you for your, uh, your time and your attendance. Uh, for the guys and the girls in the room, thank you. I know it's cold in Melbourne, it always is. Um, and it was a bit of a slog to get here. So again, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.